I am so conservative. Rationalize in my head. These are things I read. In the I'm going to talk about Willow Creek. Okay. Uh, Willow Creek. A few years back, I remembered at the time when Will Rogers said, I, "I don't belong to any organized religion. I'm a Baptist." Yeah. <laughs> I am so conservative. If you didn't jump to conclusions, you might not get any exercise. And welcome to the Unknown Webcast. In our increasingly politically correct culture, trigger warnings are becoming more and more necessary uh, for those viewers who have a fear of hearing an idea which may lead to actually thinking and potentially <laughs> changing their beliefs. This is that warning. I really am so conservative I can't turn left even when I'm driving. That includes being theologically conservative. I want to know and believe what is true and I'm even willing to change my beliefs if I am wrong. So if you're really easily offended, this is not a safe space for you. Today is January 5th, 2020, 2020, 2020. That's too many 20s, I think. Uh, and this is broadcast number 222. There used to be a show called 220. Two, oh, yeah. There was Karen Valentine. Yeah, yeah. Joining yeah. us today's unknown webcast is our friend Holly Pivik, who does put up with our uh silliness sometimes anyway <laughs> only today sometimes. we're talking we're only. taking a 2020 look at the profits of nar 2020 look in 2021 on program 2022 wow that's a lot of twos you're, I you're really kind of there yeah. with the dual dual decimal system <laughs> <laughs> my name is don vino i'm president of midwest christian outreach inc in wonder lake illinois which produces the unknown webcast uh and our senior researcher Searcher, co-host, and Time Magazine's 2006 Person of the Year. 2006, right. 2006 Person of the Year, Ron Enzel, who will introduce the sponsors of today's webcast. And here is Ronnie Baby. <laughs> Ronnie <Ronnie-Bibi. laughs> Baby. Come on, Your baby. accent gets a little thicker every time you do that. I'm going to make uh, you a deal you can't refuse. And, and, and I can prove that I am the Time Magazine 2006 Person of the Year. You know okay. that. Okay. I, I proved it to my wife just the other day. I don't know how it slipped out from under her radar, but in any case, um, the uh, yeah, gr greetings from sunny Florida, where the palm trees came out, saw their shadows, and now we have 12 more months of summer. Our sponsors. Well, before I get to the sponsors, I should prove, right? I should. Sure. Yeah. Let's, let's I, I, I should, okay. So uh, hold on a second. I had it right here. Um, oh, sure. Get us oh, all hyped up. On yeah, get you all hyped up. There it is. Here's the proof that I. M, Time Magazine's 20, 2006 person of the year. So it's right there, okay? My wife goes, but it just says you. See, I told you it says that I am the 2006 person of the year. So we'll go with that, right? All right. So our sponsors for this week's webcast, the first in 2021, include World's End Theology Outlet, our one-stop resource for your one-stop resource resource for half-baked heresies, dubious doctrines, and other ideas whose time has gone world's end, theology outlet, and guaranteed the most comfortable Bible you'll ever own, my Bible. And uh, our guest on today's webcast, insert name here, that would be Holly Pivik, has no connection whatsoever to any of the satirical content on the unknown, unknown, web, the unknown webcast, uh, hereafter known as the webcast although we probably will not mention it again. This satirical content includes any and all commercials and credits, puns, smart remarks, or anything else that might fall into the definition of satire. In the meantime, Midwest Christian Outreach Inc. bears no responsibility, liability for or responsibility for anyone's opinions regarding this satirical content. That is straight from our law firm at the uh, Dewey Cheatham and House. So 
we had to put that up for Marsha Montenegro, and we might as well just do it for everybody. Right. We don't, we don't, want, her, we don't want her to be special. So just so you know that you are not going to be connected with most anything we do on this program. Right. You're, you're, we're absolving of responsibility. Uh, yes, I, yes, you're fully absolved. So now, now I'm going to do a, a little more screen share here in our introduction because we really like Holly Pivik and we want others to really like Holly. She Pivik. almost likes us too. Okay, go ahead. Well, she hasn't <laughs> gone quite that far, but she does not mind being on here. Oh, yeah. Uh, however, she it's does have fair. a book out with a co author, Doug yes. Devet. Uh -huh. uh, called God's Super Apostles. Actually, they have a book, a workbook, and another book, uh, maybe two more books on, on this topic. How many do I have to get? Uh, well, <laughs> this would be probably sufficient unless you want to lead a small group, in which case they have questions and answers that go through the workbook as well. Uh, but it's an important one. And uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, false prophets, and it's important to understand what a false prophet is and so I thought I would get this little quote from Michael Brown up here, which we can kick around. Not Michael Brown, although sometimes. No, never mind. Uh, <laughs> but he he we says know, this. That, uh, according to Jesus. Now, this is according to Jesus, Ron. Okay. Uh, in Matthew 7, false prophets are wolves in sheep's clothing. Well, so far, so good. Okay. They are liars and deceivers who are out to destroy. Well, okay, I'm good with that so far. Gotcha. In contrast, here's a contrast. Uh, in contrast. A sincere believer can prophesy falsely, oh. which is why all New Testament prophecy uh, you know, must be is, tested. That is such an obvious distinction. I wonder why we never caught it before. I know. It's it's right there in Matthew 15. Uh, a true believer can... Uh, I thought it was in X 29. Or, yeah. <laughs> well, it's... In the second chapter of the book of second thoughts, I think. Wait a minute. The, let's, the last sentence says, let's be careful. Is let's be about, careful whom we call. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll bring it back up there. Yeah, just, so, so, so the distinction is do this just you, for have, you. you have false prophets. And See, then you have, let's be you, careful you have, whom we call a false prophet. And then you have prophets who prophesy falsely. And it's all the difference in the world. All right. the difference. All the difference. You got. You know, I. I. I mean, and the prophets who prophesy falsely are believers who just happen to prophesy falsely. But then you have false prophets, and you just should not mix the two up. Right, because it's a matter of right. intent. Now we have oh, to intent. Heart. It's not yeah. a matter of accuracy. And we can always tell the intent of other people's hearts too, can't we? I. The, the Bible know. says right there. That everyone knows the things of a man. No, I'm sorry. It says nobody knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man who's in. Now, now before I really turn to this that verse, I, I, I really, I really, Holly is like the pro <laughs> on this stuff. <laughs> We're going to so, let her. I, I, I want to read one more, uh, one more thing because she pointed out there was a there's a very popular and I think very good scholar who seems to hold a similar view. Yeah. But this one comes from online. It's Messiah Mandate. Uh, it's called the website. The Old Testament prophets and saints could not test a word by the witness of the Holy Spirit in their spirit. This is the primary way that the Spirit speaks to most believers through an inner witness, quote, unquote. So that's why in the Old Testament we have God giving Who said that? criteria for testing prophets in Deuteronomy 13 and Deuteronomy 18. It's pretty clear. Who said that? They can prophecy something that's true and does come to pass, but they lead you to worship false gods. That would be, say, like a Richard Rohr, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, he may speak things that are true, but leads you to worship a panentheistic god. Sorry about that. Versus Deuteronomy 18, which says if they prophesy even one thing falsely, you're supposed to stone them to death. Now, that somehow got changed in the New Testament. I'm not sure where that happened exactly. I think it happened somewhere in, in a book written by Wayne Grudem. But, uh, <laughs> the, uh... Holly, how would you like to weigh in on that one? That <laughs> well, I do I do have this book here by Wayne Grudem. I think the one you're referencing, Ron, The uh, Gift of Prophecy uh, in the New Testament I, in today. I, I'd have to look for it. Uh, I, I actually borrowed a copy. I really, I, I'm going to be meeting with the guy I borrowed it from and give it back to him. But yeah, um, yeah, it probably is the same one. Look, that one looks a little thicker. Did he revise it recently? I don't know. Maybe maybe there's another another one. This this is a pretty thick one. But um, but one thing I wanted to say about this is many charismatics believe that um, 
the New Testament gift of prophecy that people could have that gift and that and make mistakes and error when they prophesy and still have the gift of prophecy. Uh, what the NAR, the New Apostolic Reformation leaders do, they go beyond that and they would actually claim that someone can can be a prophet in a sense of an Old Testament prophet and even hold uh, or they can hold a formal governing office. Um, and, and so they're authoritative prophets. Um, their words must be received. Their words must be obeyed. And they would also say that those prophets can make mistakes when they prophesy. And, and that's a departure from what Wayne Grudem says. Wayne Grudem would say that that people with the gift of prophecy today do not hold a, a formal office. Right. Yeah. They don't govern the church. They, they can't say, thus saith the Lord and give these authoritative words that must be obeyed. And so, so there's a distinction between, um, I would say the NAR leaders make illicit use of Wayne Grudem oh, to yeah. support their teachings. Yeah, but he kind of opens the door, doesn't he? I mean. Yeah, many people would, many people say that, many, uh, many scholars and, and people feel that way that, that by saying that he definitely opened the door and the NAR leaders, um, you know, took that, took that and ran, ran with it. Um, people yeah. would say, you know, the Old Testament is clear that if you are a genuine prophet of God, then um, all you all of your words will will come to pass. And and your, your prophetic so what words. We want to clarify the prophetic words. That doesn't mean right. that they don't make mistakes in other areas of life. Right, right. They're making actual prophecies that do not come true. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, you know. Uh, this is hard for us, right, Don, because we try not to take a stand on peripheral issues. Right. We don't get in, and, and Holly knows this, and she doesn't either, which I really appreciate. I, I don't even know where she stands on the whole charismatic question. Right now she's sitting. it isn't right essential. <laughs> you know, we, we could have, uh, we could, uh, I think a case can be made. Uh, you guys can interrupt me, but I think a case can be made that the, sign gifts continue today. I don't agree with it. I, I think there's a stronger case that they do not. But that is an inter, intramural, intramural? That is an in-house debate. I, I like way, that he's on the <laughs> Wayne Grudem's on the cover of Bible Study Magazine this month, just so you know. So okay. that guy's all over the place. All right, but, so there's a lot of things that we can we can disagree on that, that we kind of classify as the mechanics of the faith. How does God do stuff? I don't really know. I have a view that I think is true. Ron has a view that he thinks is true. Yeah. And Ron is certainly entitled to be wrong. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I use that entitlement every chance I get. Uh, <laughs> yeah. he, uh, I used he, to love the late J. Vernon McGee because he would lay out clearly uh, the all possible views. And then he would say, but if you want to be right, <laughs> if you want to be right, <laughs> so you know, so we don't want to offend our Pentecostal charismatic brothers and sisters, but um, I think we want them to realize what a very serious thing it is to say, "Thus says the Lord." Right. And what what you're doing when you speak that way has um, it, the, the Bible has very specific. Um, very, very sobering warnings about how, you know, about people doing that who are not really hearing from the Lord. And it gives very clear, um, very clear ways of determining whether people are really hearing from the Lord. I, I, the first two that come to my mind is, one, if they do not speak this word according to this word, that is according to what is in Scripture already, they have no light in them. They have no uh, it's like uh, they, they have no dawn, as I think it literally reads. But the other one, of course, is does it, if it's a predicted prophecy, does it take place? Does it actually happen? And if those two things don't square, then that is spiritually dangerous for everybody. And at one time it was lethal. Right. So. For the prophets. Yeah. For the prophet. Yeah. So back to, back to Holly. Uh, what do you say? Uh, you're you? not speaking out against charismatics. Your your very narrow focus is on what? So so Doug Guyvet, my co-author, he's a professor at, at Talbot School of Theology and um, at Biola University. And we we wrote two books together, as you shared. And yes, we're very clear that we are not critiquing um, 
classical uh, Pentecostalism or historic uh, charismatic teachings. Um, what what we critique is the NAR teaching. This is the core NAR teaching, New Apostolic Reformation teaching, that present day apostles and prophets must hold offices, governing offices in the church. These are for, formal offices, and like a pastor or an elder, but that they these are even viewed as higher offices. And pastors and elders actually should come under the authority of the apostles and prophets. And the reason is is apostles and prophets, according to NAR leaders, are the only two offices that have been authorized by God to bring new revelation to the church. So they would say that the church has been operating for for almost 2,000 years um, with at, with missing the you know the two two of the fingers, uh, two of the offices that that in Ephesians 4:11 says that there are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Uh, and according to the NAR understanding of that passage, these are five governing offices that should continue through all generations of the church, but the church, for the most part, has not acknowledged the prophets and apostles, and so they must come back, uh, and so that since these are the only two offices authorized to give new revelation to the church, and this revelation is seen as strategies that the church must have in order to complete the Great Commission which has been redefined in the NAR movement as a commission to uh, take dominion or socio-political control of America, of all the nations of the earth, and set up God's kingdom uh, prior to God Christ's return. Um, and so the Great Commission has has been redefined as a, as a dominion mandate as well. And so they're giving these new strategies that will enable all of their followers to become miracle workers and work even greater miracles than Jesus did and then they can work these miracles that will result in um, establishing God's kingdom on earth. Do you ever get the impression when they talk about dominion that what they're really talking about is dominion over our bank accounts? That uh, that they well, the like pro yeah, and the prosperity gospel is 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 subsumed. It it is part of the teaching in NAR because the teaching is that the church will need the wealth, wealth, great wealth to set up God's kingdom. And so the wealth of the wicked needs to be transferred to the righteous, uh, mm. the people, the apostles in this movement, so that they'll have the resources that are needed to set up God's kingdom on earth. So that's a well-known prophecy in this movement called the great end time transfer of wealth. That's one <laughs> of the new revelations that, that the prophets in this movement claim they've received. G-E-T-O-W. Get out. <laughs> you know what? You raise an interesting issue. Uh, unrelated to this, but we have another group vying to transfer all of the wealth as well. The globalists are, are preparing either late this year or early next year for a financial global reset. And that will then enable them to kind of transfer all of the wealth to where they feel it should go to set up their kingdom. So you really do have two kingdoms vying for preeminence uh, today, the NAR <laughs> and the globalist. So, and, uh, and the prophets have actually used, some of the NAR prophets have used that language as well. They've referred to it as the great reset, which I found interesting, the, the end time transfer of wealth. And they, they actually believe that um, the events that have been occurring this year with COVID and, and everything that all the chaos this year will help lead to the great reset uh -huh. okay now i have a question for you before we kind of move on to the next thing uh a like says that uh we are a small church in mexico could miss miss Ms. Pivik, mrs pivik <laughs> we okay. can say that right mrs you're okay with that uh that fully fine <laughs> give advice on something we could add to our creed to differentiate ourselves from the nar heresy that's a great question it is a great question, and I, I would like to say that um, uh, Doug and I have actually developed a position paper. There was a, a, a church that, that was trying to develop a position paper to adopt um, because this church had, had been divided by the NAR, and a new pastor came in and said, we need to adopt a position paper to make sure this doesn't happen again, that these NAR teachings don't come into our church again and cause this division again. And so they reached out to us and um, we drafted a position paper that, that other churches have adopted as well. Um, and it's available on my website at hollypivot.com. Um, 
a position paper, but so a light could go there and, and see that whole position paper if, uh, if that is put in the search box, uh, position paper. But one thing that could be added, a church could adopt is a statement to the effect of, we deny that, that there are present day governing offices of apostle and prophet. Um, that would be something that could be added to, you know, the beliefs of the church. Um, they could also mention specific practices that they reject that have come out of these strategies that are revealed by the new apostles and prophets. So, for example, they could say we re we reject um, teachings about a great end time transfer of wealth or about the seven mountain mandate or um, about spiritual mapping and strategic level spiritual warfare and we we reject the teaching that um that gifts the spiritual gifts can be activated uh in all individuals who desire them in other words that the we reject the belief that anybody can learn to prophesy or work miracles or learn to heal people by taking part in prophetic activation exercises and mm -hmm. these kind of things could be uh also also added to the statement so how would you go about answering someone I mean, I can think of things I would say, but uh, when you held up the three, uh, yeah, the three fingers saying. Yeah, yeah. I know. I was trying <laughs> to <get that. laughs> okay. Well, you got, okay. So uh, how would you answer them? You, you, they're, they're, they're accusing the, the historic Christian church. It's, it's really an accusation. It's, I would say it's also an, an indictment. And they're saying, you guys have deliberately shut down, or maybe mistakenly shut down, it, but incorrectly shut down two of the biggest offices of the church, apostles and prophets. Mm -hmm. So how, how do we go about, how would you answer them? Um, so, um, well, I would say that um, they would need to show from scripture that these offices uh well, first of all, I would say there is, the, so there were a variety of apostles in the New Testament. Um, um, there were apostles, the, the 12 apostles of Christ and Paul. Um, these apostles did govern the church and they, uh, many of them wrote scripture and contributed to the writing of scripture. Um, and, and then there were other apostles in the New Testament who were more like missionaries and church planners. And mm -hmm. so if people are using the term apostles in that sense today, you know, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people who, who would claim to be apostles who hold formal offices in church governance. Uh, likewise, there are people who claim to be prophets uh, today who claim that they just have a gift of prophecy, maybe speaking words of encouragement and edification in a local church setting or to individuals, but they wouldn't claim they have an office of governing the church. And so in the New Testament, you see this office of prophet, or of apostle, I'm sorry, that the office of apostle that the 12 and Paul had. And then you you see, you don't see an office of prophet in the New Testament, though. I I, I don't think anyone has been able to make a case that there was a governing office of prophet, even though and, there and, were prophets. And I would hesitate to call what we see in the Old Testament an office. Uh, right. I would tell right. you, it's not, it's not established in the law of Moses. Right, I agree. I, I don't think there was an office of prophet in the Old Testament either. The prophets acted as advisors to the king, but it doesn't seem that there was an office of prophet. And so, and so, for someone to say today that that the pro offices of apostle and prophet and giving new revelation that these are ongoing offices, they would need to demonstrate that from scripture, which um, I believe well, they failed to maybe, do. Maybe, but we have. Well, we're not there yet. Uh, <laughs> I, I do want to say that uh, some of uh, the prophets or prophet wannabes uh, get highly irritated and agitated when we start pointing out these inconsistencies and, and frankly, false prophecies. We have uh, uh, Kenneth Copeland, for example, he pronounced God's judgment against the coronavirus, declared that a cure would appear right now. And then he blew the virus away. It wasn't all that effective. And so as a prophet, he didn't really do well. Uh, and some of them have a solution to that. Uh, Benny Hinn, for example, has a... Yeah, he has, he has a product that we he wants us to be aware of. It's from World's End Theology Outlet. And we have a special announcement from them. Your spiritual rights are under attack. People who oppose your teaching are criticizing you by name in public. Are you looking for that one verse in scripture that says, 
If you don't like them, kill them. Well, we have something even better. The Benny Hinn Holy Ghost machine gun. Because you just don't have to take it anymore. It's fully automatic, so there's no waiting for results. It's high-capacity magazines wipe out every detractor. It's high-caliber rounds blow their heads off. Well, you know, in the spirit, of course. The Benny Hinn. Holy Ghost Machine Gun, only at World's End Theology Outlet. So um, I was going to say, you know, get one of those, and you'll get, get rid of all of your well, spiritual energy. And some, some, by the way, take umbrage that we would do something like this that we're just being mean, except this is Benny Hinn's own words. This is what he oh, yeah, did, did anybody ever complain about that commercial? Because we, we can get the video and yeah. show you. He, he invented the Holy Ghost machine gun. He actually created it. But what I would say also is, okay, you, you, you brought up an interesting distinction, potential. Not, I don't know if everybody agrees, but I, let's just grant that there were governing apostles, the 12, and there were non-governing apostles. They were they were more like, I mean, if you look at the word, the, the word apostle means like a delegate, uh, someone who's sent to represent you. So, so there were 12 apostles of Christ plus Paul. They were all 13 were apostles of Christ. And then uh, there were, you could say, apostles of apostles, people delegated by the apostles, the apostles. that were, they were, they did not have the same status. Um, and uh, so, in other words, we're not talking about a governing office if, if it did continue. And there's, and we look at church history and we see no indication from the writings of the successors of the apostles that prophets in that sense, or apostles continued. Um, the, uh, the other thing I would say is there, one, one of the things they're accusing us of, of is a, rejecting the office itself. Well, but that we're, we're not using it. Well, we have the Bible. That's where the office, that's, that's, we have the, the office is speaking to us every day through God's words. This book was written by apostles and prophets. So, so here, here's my question then to, to Holly. Uh, does scripture take priority over someone claiming to be a prophet or it does scripture subsume, subsumed under the prophet here's the thing um pretty much every leader in this movement will say that that scripture is the uh final authority that their words can never con contradict scripture uh the scripture is even a higher authority than them but the thing is is there's what they say and then how it plays out in practice and so when they're revealing new truths that they call new strategies that the church must have in order to set up god's kingdom on earth that is to equate their words with scripture because they, even if they don't actually physically, you know, append their words to a Bible, they're saying that their words are essential to uh, the mission of the church for Christians receiving their words and that the mission of the church cannot be completed without receiving their new strategies. And so it's in effect to put their words on a par with scripture. And then moreover, there's a doctrine in this movement called prophetic illumination and this is the belief that apostles and prophets receive new insights into under understanding scripture that no one has ever seen before, or at least new understandings of scripture that maybe the first generation of Christians had and have, and then has subsequently been lost through the centuries. And so, so the idea that an apostle or prophet is needed to, to reveal an understanding of scripture that, that nobody else has seen before is is also um, in effect to to put their words above scripture. So yeah, so as a practical measure, their words do go above scripture, although they would verbally deny that. Yes, yes. Okay. Oh, so that, that raises all sorts of other interesting. Well, we we've, we've, we've had people. Uh, there's a guy named John Robinson who uh, was on the Mayflower. Uh, now the Pilgrims were not. They don't easily fit into any category within Protestantism. Um, they, I, I'm not really sure of all their beliefs, but one of the guys, one of the people uh, who was on the Mayflower as a pilgrim to the U.S. to the colonies uh, was a man named John Robinson, and he said, "I am verily persuaded the Lord hath more truth yet to break forth out of His holy word." 
Uh, so you have these kinds of sentiments were expressed many times over the past few hundred years, but um, I I find it kind of dangerous. Uh, yeah, I, I yeah. can grant grant it on a theoretical level that there might have been something that every single Christian missed, but I I find every time I've seen that happen, every time I've seen somebody present something that was never presented before. The results have never been good. So, yeah, I think that's generally true. Now, I, which raises a question to me, because Holly said something that all of a sudden my brain's going, wait a minute, where, where is that in, in Scripture? And that is essentially that is our task to Christianize the world in order for the Lord to return. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Well, you can you can see how people might read. Now, that's a, that's a question for Holly. Yeah, okay. I'll let Holly answer it. <laughs> right so so you so the what was your question exactly don okay. sorry well, the question is because you're talking about the seven month mandate so we can mm -hmm. reclaim the world and so that christ mm -hmm. can return so mm -hmm. fundamentally somewhere mm -hmm. in the new testament they have a passage that says your task guys is to go out and christianize the world in order for me to be able to return one would hope they have a passage. Well, they often point to passages in the Old Testament, which, which in my in my view and the view of many, apply to the millennium. And they would say that you know this this time of peace that you see on earth that's that's prophesied by the Old Testament prophets um, indicates that 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 will well they they don't see that as belonging to the millennium. They see that as as belonging to to this time before Christ returns. And they would also say, they, so they, they would disagree maybe as to how much of God's kingdom can be set up on earth prior to Christ's return. But uh, Bill Johnson, who's the chief apostle at Bethel Church in Redding, California, the most influential NAR church today in the world probably, um, he, he would say that it's much more, much more of God's kingdom can be set up prior to Christ's return than we've ever imagined before. Um, and, and so, and the leaders in this movement will really disparage Christians who believe, who are premillennial, who believe that the earth will grow darker and more wicked prior to Christ's return. Uh, they really disparage those who hold to a pre-trib view of the rapture. They call that escapism, you know, that the idea that, that, uh, Christians will ex want to escape and, and flee the world rather than being part of the solution and fixing all the world's problems through the prophetic revelations they receive that will supposedly enable them to find solutions to all the world's problems, poverty, um, you know, uh, the climate change, whatever the world's problems are, they believe that the prophets will receive supernatural insights that will enable the church to solve those problems mm -hmm. and set up God's kingdom on earth. So when you say they disparage Christians who hold these views, uh, am I detecting a, a streak of elitism in this movement? Yes, definitely, definitely. There's elitism. So, so, and of course, you know, they would they would probably deny that. But, but the idea in this movement, and many people who come out of this movement will say that they used to view Christians as kind of a a class Christians and B class Christians, and the A class Christians were the ones who followed the apostles and prophets, were up to date with all the new revelations um believed in you know um that they can learn to work miracles and become this miracle working army and and really focused on signs and wonders in these things and other christians are really dead christians um who who don't emphasize signs and wonders um who don't follow the apostles and prophets um they're they're kind of dead i guess carnal christians that are really will sit on the sidelines in the end times because because they we're, won't have the strategies they need to set up God's kingdom. We're going to be benched, in other words. Right. <laughs> we're going to be. Well, we, we have uh, some prophecies from 2020, and that's we yeah. do want to comment on these because that's the, at least the title of what we're doing. Uh, yeah. For example, Rodney Howard Brown, and his Word Faith, Laughing Revival, also involved with NAR, prophesied that he would personally cure coronavirus just like the Zika virus, and that he would personally keep the former from coming to Florida. So how did that work out? <laughs> 
Yeah, there were a lot. So 2020 was an especially bad year for the NAR profits. <laughs> uh, Not a good year. <laughs> it started, I would say it started back even before 2020. You know, around Christmas time, 2019 was when Bethel Church and Reading, I thought that through their declarations, they could raise the little girl, Olive, two-year-old right. little girl who died unexpectedly. She was the daughter of one of the church's worship leaders. They tried to raise her from the dead for, for six days by making speaking declarations that they thought their spoken mm -hmm. words had the authority to, to bring her back from the dead. Of course, that failed, but national media followed that story very closely. And so that's kind of how they started off 2020. And then they went into 2020 and they didn't foresee COVID-19. You know, all the usual, every year the prophets release their, their words of the Lord for the new year, or many of them do. And they were all the typical prophecies that this will be the year that that your wealth will increase. This will be the year that the great harvest of souls will will begin to take place. Um, this will be the year everything will go well for Christians. Well, the um, so <laughs> none of them, none of them foresaw COVID-19. Um, and then our, our, so our wealth decreased uh, because, you know, <laughs> right. the start, I mean, well. It, it, we, you can argue that the stock market came back, but most people have a lot less money now than they did right. well, at the beginning of 2020. They also prophesied that Trump is a uh, deliverer uh, right. that would lead the nation to revival. I wish these people wouldn't prophesy. <laughs> Maybe well, would. and so, right, and so their prophecies about Donald Trump um, uh, obviously seem to have failed. That many, many NAR prophets prophesied that that Trump would be reelected, and um, multiple uh, secular news outlets have have followed this. Um, and and that's one one bad thing that is the outcome of of these false prophecies is that atheists um, and and people who are not Christian have been uh, using these these prophecies, these false prophecies to mock all of Christians, to mock all right. of evangelicals. Yeah, and so some, you can go to yeah. YouTube and find videos that they've created making fun of these prophets with millions of views. Um, and so, so this is making it harder for other Christians, for those of us to share the gospel going forward. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's a really sad, sad thing yeah. that, that is the outcome of these prophecies. It's, it's, it's almost as if they jinxed 2020 for us, you know, <laughs> and, you know, many of the prophets also prophesied that COVID would be brought to an end before it became a global pandemic. Sean Bowles is a pastor in Los Angeles and a prophet who's closely connected with Bethel Church in Reading. He was speaking in South Africa with Bill Johnson uh, back in February 28, 2020. And he said, the Lord showed me the end of coronavirus. The tide is turning now. He also told Fox News it's not going to be the pandemic that people are afraid of. Um, so he was one of, of many prophets that said that, that COVID would really end before it started and it wouldn't be a really big thing. On top of that, the declarations of these prophets have failed to end COVID. Uh, many, many of these prophets have been teaching, uh, including Bill Johnson at, at Bethel Redding, that he's an apostle, that that uh, Christians have the authority through their spoken words to make decrees and declarations uh, that can bring coronavirus to an end. And despite all the declarations and the decrees the apostles and prophets have been making, they haven't been able to, to bring COVID to an end. Um, at Bethel Reading, uh, all, the fault, all the people who attend that church there, uh, they would recite a declaration, everywhere I go becomes a perfect health zone. Um, but despite their declaration of perfect health, the church had a major outbreak of COVID, uh, reporting over 300 cases among their, their students and churchgoers. Um, and, and Bill Johnson has preached sermons from Psalm 91 saying that, uh, insinuating that, that followers could avoid catching coronavirus if they just made decrees and declarations against <laughs> it. So, so it's been a really bad year uh, I mean, for the prophets, and, and they know it too. Bill Johnson. Bill Johnson actually said uh, on Victory Channel, this was in a recent interview on December 16th, Victory Channel's Kenneth Copeland's uh, YouTube channel. Yeah. And during an interview, he was featured on along with Dutch che Sheets and Lance Wall now. These are two other NAR um, prophets and leaders. Um, he said that 
that he acknowledged that people are mocking the prophets, including many people within the church are mocking the prophets because of um, these these apparently failed prophecies, especially about Donald Trump. And and Bill Johnson said that it's a tragedy because it's part of the foundation of the church, the apostles and prophet. If we as the body of Christ are in any way mocking that gift because things don't seem to be as they have announced and we're in real trouble. I've been praying that the hand of the Lord would be obvious and openly defending these that he has raised up with his word in their mouth. That's the thing I've been contending for. So even Bill Johnson recognizes that the apostles and prophets are have fallen in disrepute uh, with their, their failed then, predictions this year. But, but then the, the real problem, according to him, is not that. It's not that. I mean, it's, it's not that. I'm sorry. It's the, the real problem is the disrepute, not the cause of the disrepute. Right, right. It's not that the prophets were wrong. Right. Um, it's that that they need to be vindicated because uh, because they're being mocked and then people won't accept apostles and prophets as being for today. So uh, I'm, think, uh, I'm thinking of some verses in Isaiah. When, when I think of all of the uh, prophecies you mentioned that they had for the upcoming year, uh, but be, okay, the word, the phrase smooth things came to mind and it's found in Isaiah. Uh, chapter 30, uh, for their rebellious people, lying ch lying children, children uh, unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord, uh, who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, uh, do not prophesy to us what is right, speak to us smooth things, prophesy, oh, I like that, yeah. prophesy illusions. Mm. Uh, they... Um, and of course, Jeremiah said that they say peace, peace when there is no peace. There is no peace, right? Uh, but you know, th this is this is the hallmark of a false prophet. He he tells you what you want to hear. He the people say to the seers, "Do not see, do, don't really see. Tell us what we want to hear." And to the prophets, "Do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things." So so really, this is a judgment on the church it's a it's it's getting what you want and god letting you have it it is but you know a lot of people do seem to think that these things are somewhere in scripture and when you go through it contextually and you point out that it really isn't in there and then you point out something like deuteronomy 13 and 18 and ask well where did that happen they might look at you and go well my bible doesn't really say that and we have a sponsor that kind of deals with that question. Well, you're talking about, you know, the smooth things again, uh, right? So, uh, yeah, let's talk about that because we all know that awkward feeling when someone in a Bible study says, I wish the Bible didn't have all these verses about hell. Or when you're having couples devotions and your spouse says, you know, I'm just not comfortable with a ver with verses that teach the traditional view of marriage. Or you're sitting in church and you're thinking, why do all the Bibles I read have to agree with what conservative pastors are teaching? Well, that's why we're introducing my Bible. It's guaranteed the most comfortable Bible you'll ever own. We've spent literally minutes creating a way you can have the Bible that's perfect for you. You used to have to go down some dark back alley to get a Bible like this, but not anymore. Just write down all the places where you want to make your Bible more comfortable for you, and then email them to us or enter them into our handy online form. And the results speak for themselves. Yolanda from Portland says, now that I have my Bible, I never worry that my white male pastor's sermons might actually be right. Ben from seminary says, my Bible gave me the confidence I needed to drop out of my Hebrew and Greek classes. Renee from Madison says, every single one of my anti-capitalist, anti-police, and anti-social protest chants now comes from my Bible. And Buck50 from Brooklyn says, since I got my Bible, I have no trouble basing my violent and misogynistic lyrics on scripture. So when someone throws an uncomfortable verse at you, you can say, that's not in my Bible at mybible.cult. So 
Now, I, I want to just point out one more time, Holly, for the viewers, and there's a description, uh, a link in the description box below where they can get your book, God's Super Apostles, and they can even uh, get the workbook that goes with it. Uh, why should they do that from the author? Why should they get it? Aside from the fact <laughs> that you believe it's really important, what's helpful about it? Well, the book, it, it, it explains what the the new apostolic reformation the theological framework for the new apostolic reformation so if people read this book they will have more of an understanding of the new apostolic reformation than even many of the people who are part of the new apostolic reformation <laughs> um, because it, it gives a framework the theological framework it explains what the core teachings and practices are it gives a sense of the size and scope of this movement and we also have the larger book um this one's beat up, <laughs> but A New Apostolic Reformation, A Biblical Response to a Worldwide Movement. This is the larger book that's much more detailed, heavily documented, goes much more in depth into the uh, teachings of this movement as well. But the, the other book that you show, God's Super Apostles, has a lot of really practical advice at the end um, for people who have questions. Maybe they know that their uh, church or they're afraid their church might be getting caught up in these teachings. So it gives advice about how to approach their church leaders and talk to them about their concerns. Maybe some people realize that maybe they are part of the new apostolic reformation and want to know how to distance themselves from this movement. So it gives advice for those people. Right. Maybe some people want to protect their children from getting caught up in this movement. So it has advice about how to do that. So this has a lot of practical advice and stories and anecdotes of people too who've been harmed by this movement. See, and that's really important. Now, just this is a personal thing for me. This is not necessarily biblical, not biblical, anti-biblical. Usually, when I talk with people that are in severe heresy, I have found it is better to a be equipped myself on the issues, whatever the issues are, and b to ask questions rather than make assertions. If I can ask them a question that'll help them to think things through, they may be willing to look at more information. Whereas if I just make a, 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 a assertions like you are following a false prophet, there's times when that is really appropriate, but there's a lot of times when you go, okay, that push is just going to cause them to push back. They are invested in this belief. Yeah, and, and you're and taking think, away their investment. I think most people jump there too early in the, in the debate or the discourse, in other, in other words, jump to from the probing questions to the assertions. I think I don't think you do that. I think a lot of people though do it too early. I see this in social media, especially. Just find a thought on that, Holly. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear do, that. Do you, have, do you have any thoughts on on well, that? Yeah, I really like Greg Kokel's book, Tactics. Yep. It's it's a book about um, how to the tactics for navigating discussions and it's aimed at discussions with non-believers primarily. But he talks about that a lot about the asking questions. Um, and and so I actually like to apply what he wrote in his book tactics to conversations with people in the NAR um, and and how to winsomely and, and persuade, you know, to go th go through um tactically and and interact with people about this movement because um it, if you start with questions um then people will let down their guard and um and it won't feel like you're attacking them and, and you can actually gain information too by asking questions that will yeah. then help help you later uh you know know how to gently expose the weaknesses in, in their thinking Right, because they're going to tell you why they're invested in what they're invested in. Uh, I, Jesus did that kind of thing when he had a, a, a someone come up and say, okay, which is the greatest of the commandments? And uh, he said, he didn't say this one or that one. He said, well, you've read the law. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. then he built on the response uh, because he answered correctly, and he built on a response from there. Uh mm -hmm. So tactics are, are can be really important and uh, unfortunately not often taught in churches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, it's not just having the knowledge of what people in the NAR believe, but it's it's um, knowing the questions to ask them. And a lot of times it might be a question like uh, if somebody says shares that they've really enjoyed the teaching of Bill Johnson and Bethel Church in Reading, 
or maybe it's Mike, Mike Bickle at the International House of Prayer in Kansas City, Missouri, say, well, what, what is it that you um, particularly appreciate about, about Bill Johnson's teaching or Mike Bickle's teaching? Um, and then when they share that, it, you could follow up with, um, where do you find support for that in scripture? Um, and then often what they'll do is they'll give a, a Bible verse that's being used out of context. And then you could follow up with something like, well, um, that's interesting. I've never quite read that passage that way before. Um, have you ever considered any al alternative um, understandings of that passage? Have you ever looked at any Bible commentaries or anything like that to see if people have other have other understandings? And, and then by doing that, maybe it will at least plant some seeds of doubt in their head and, sure. and cause them later to go, um, you know, do a little more study and maybe look at yeah. some Bible commentaries. Now, that line of questioning would not work with a Jehovah's Witness, for example. You know, I can see where I can see where that would go off the tracks, because have you ever considered something else besides the watchtower is like right. well, the quickest way of getting kicked out of the organization. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, it doesn't it's um, the NAR isn't as authoritarian in that sense, is it? Well, and, it, it it's it is. It really. It is. It all comes down to authority. I would say in this movement, they really do believe the apostles and yeah. prophets have been given authority, and and, and they're and they're loath yeah. to question that authority. Right. But that means, go ahead. Sorry. Well, what, what, when I say authoritarian, I mean mm -hmm. in the sense of you're not even allowed to read contrary opinions. Right. They don't say that, and, and they may discourage it. Um, Bill Johnson has made some statements to the effect of. Of uh, discouraging people from reading things from that are written by people who don't walk and working miracles. Yeah. Right. Uh, now, I would distinguish between two types of two approaches to that. In other words, there's the top down. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the top down. Uh, you must not read this. If you do, you'll get kicked out. That's the right, watchtower right. society. And then there's the uh, discouraging you from doing it and relying on social pressure within the movement so right. that. Yeah, so that you end up kind of being spiritually ostracized, but not necessarily kicked out. So does uh, so you're saying that they will do the latter in the right? In the I would say it's more more of the latter. It's more of a social pressure. Um, yeah, not that you will be formally kicked out right. of. And, and to be clear, the NAR is not a single organizational entity. I know you guys know that, but not all people know that it's um, it's a set of beliefs. So any church that that believes that apostles and prophets are are for today and that they should govern the church is NAR by definition. Whether the, whether or not they accept that label for themselves or put that label on their website, um, and so it's not an organization someone can be kicked out of either. And most NAR churches would not say they would kick someone out for for reading something that disagrees with their teaching. And we can be glad for that, and we can kind mm -hmm. of use it as uh, if you know. What mm -hmm. if you when you're doing this when you're using tactics you know, and and you know what your your the person you're trying to reach is up against mm -hmm. in terms of getting out of what they're trapped in, um, it it helps you to know how far you can kind of gently push them in the direction you know that they need to go. So and planting seeds of doubt is just so good, even if it doesn't seem like at the time they're open to hearing it. That that seed will germinate maybe later, and and maybe they will sneak over, you know, and look at a Bible commentary <laughs> <laughs> when nobody's around. Well, even even Jehovah's Witnesses will do that. You know, that they will do it behind the backs of their local Kingdom Hall. I mean, uh, people, mm -hmm. but they, if they're sufficiently motivated, so right, yeah. right, and and walking them through. Even a Jehovah's <clears throat> Witness, Ron Ron knows this. We've been doing this for over three decades now. Uh, there's been occasions when we've led uh, Jehovah's Witnesses to the faith from the Watchtower by asking questions about the Bible. Now, they had particular understandings, and so I would go to passages that the Watchtower literally has nothing written on mm. uh, and ask them, okay, can you help me understand this passage? Because we have here Jehovah sending Jehovah. How does that work exactly? When does Jehovah send, send Jehovah anywhere? And, and, and Jehovah is going to dwell in the midst of the people. When did that happen? Uh, and and he communicated with Jehovah. And have now they have to start scratching their head and start actually looking at the text 
Uh, and it's just a question. I'm not saying anything. I'm just asking a question. Mm -hmm. So, um, but back to the NAR, you're really, you're following kind of the same processes. Is It's an interesting proposition. I haven't heard it that way before. Maybe you can show me in the context how that plays itself out. Mm -hmm. Now, in our you now, one of the things you do, Don, a lot is appeal to um, bad pro prophecy gone bad in the Watchtower Society, you know, failed prophecies, right. and and sometimes that's pretty effective with Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, how how effective is it with NAR people? Do you Good think? Question. Well, right, because they've already set it up that you can be a genuine prophet of God and make mistakes when you prophesy. It's it's not um, always effective because they've are their followers have already been primed that it's okay for them to make mistakes. Um, but and interestingly, I would say the majority of their prophecies are not even specific enough. They're so vague that there's well, actually no way to even test well, whether they've is, been fulfilled. There's an interesting parallel between what you just said and the Watchtower Society. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is that it, what you talk about how they say it's possible to to be mistaken as a prophet. The Watchtower Society has this doctrine of new light right. that, that allows them to overturn, to, to maintain that they are Jehovah's prophetic organization mm -hmm. and yet overturn previous prophecies yeah. for all practical purposes. Mm -hmm. So what you really have to do, what what I think another thing probably that both the NAR and the Watchtower Society have in common is that most of the people in it are uninformed about what the Bible says about false prophecy, what right. the, the verses which point to the fact that God really He take He took takes it so seriously that for His Old Testament people, He stoning was the penalty. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I mean that's pretty serious. So, you, so anyways, um, but right. this has been a really bad year. I mean, it's it's been amazingly bad mm -hmm. for. Uh, I, I guess I, I want to know, because I didn't follow it that closely, what did they tell the parents of that little six-year-old girl, uh, uh, Olive? Well, so the parents, uh, the mom was a worship leader at Bethel Church in Reading. And so um, she actually was behind, uh, she was she was one who really felt like, you know, God wanted them to make decrees that, that Olive would be de uh, resurrected. Um, and so, and the church agreed to come along and support her in that. And so, and they, they enlisted their followers worldwide to agree to make decrees and declarations to raise Olive. So I don't know that they had to tell the mom and dad anything so much because they are steeped in, in these teachings themselves and, and mm -hmm. were actually initiated, um, the attempts to raise Olive. Yeah, well, as, Dan, well, as Don will tell you, I, I'm going to have to go soon. You guys can keep on talking. But I'm going to make a prophecy. <laughs> it, it's not a, a, it's not a, an inspired prophecy. It is a, uh, I don't know what you want to call it. I'm, I'm going to use the word in a much diminished sense, a, a word that uh, maybe a journalist would use it or a politician. In other words, I, I'm going to I'm going to predict that uh, it might not be directly due to 2020, but I think in the near future, and I don't know when that is, I'm not going to get boxed in on a time frame. We're going to see a lot of people leave the NAR very disillusioned. Uh, they're, they're, I don't, I don't know how many. I, I just think we're going to. It's going to be noticeable that a lot of people. You're going to start hearing this refrain. You know, I really believe. But then when all of these big, the, the big ones, the ones, mm -hmm. the big names, were making these really outrageous predictions that mm -hmm. fell spectacularly mm -hmm. short of what they predicted. I mean, they were li literally the opposite happened of what they said, literally. Mm -hmm. the the, the God contradicted them. <laughs> God, no. uh, <clears throat> That's true. Now, th there's something that I want to point out about Matthew 7, which is rarely commented on when talking about false prophets, is the entirety from verse 15 of chapter 7, through verse uh, 23 of that same chapter is talking about false prophets. It's not talking about the fruits of a true believer versus non-believer. It's talking about prophets, false prophets specifically. And in Judgment Day, it says, On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, 
cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of, guess what, lawlessness. Mm -hmm. So even though they were making prophetic predictions, casting out demons and doing miraculous stuff, even though they were doing that, they were still false prophets. And, and you know, they they were lawless. They were hiding their real lifestyles uh, mm -hmm. behind this cloak of being a prophet. And I, we might also see some of that being exposed. I don't know. It, 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 lately, the Lord has been providentially allowing a lot of pastors who've been leading double lives to be exposed mm -hmm. uh, outside of the NIR. And uh, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe it'll come there as well. But I think... Um, I think it is God's providence. 2020 was God's providence, especially for people in the NAR. And um, I just wanted to let you know, Holly, that people are really impressed with what you're saying here. Sounds like these are people who know the NAR and are glad you're here uh, mm -hmm. warning people about it. Yeah. Um, now, I, I want to ask, Holly, we're, we're going to kind of officially end. We've been doing this recently. Uh, but if you'd like to hang on for about five or ten minutes afterwards, we can kick some stuff around and let people ask questions if you're okay with that. And I'll say sure, adios. that'd be great. I'll say adios to you guys after after I do this. Resident cult leader profile is Neil. Before me, our wardrobe manager is. See how it fits you. Our culinary services are provided by Chef Hammond Cheese. Our tinfoil hat provisioner is just in case. Our Jehovah's Witnesses coverage comes from Armageddon and Deopposer. Our Mormon archives manager is Polly Gummus. Our liberal denominations bureau chief is Lucy Goosey. Our transgender issues coverage comes from Ben Hur. Our special correspondent for cults based on the Hindenburg disaster and flying turkeys, O.D. Humanity. Our fact-checking supervisor is Yoleg Pulling. Our technical assist assistance comes through Murky Research. Our legal advisors are at the law firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. Our grievance resolution director is Yvonne Pisami. Our director of privacy assurance is Wire Tapping. And our original idea sourcing comes from Drew A. Blank. The Unknown Webcast is a production of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc., in cooperation with Emergency Manicure Productions, both of whom are solely responsible for this content, although you will never be able to prove that in a court of law. Never, never. And did never. you notice I corrected a misspelling? Oh, did you check check our dates on there? By the way, I didn't check. That. Oh, I did. I got it. Oh, I did not. You, you know what? I didn't change it to twenty twenty one. Okay, well, I better fix that. Right now, uh, I also corrected uh, O D Humanity's name. It wasn't O D and then the word humanity. It was O D Hue as the name and Manatee as in the sea cows. Okay, right, so. so uh, Okay. So this is the year of our corrections. How do you like that? <laughs> yeah, let me uh, let me make sure that our uh, that our our copyright shows. Okay, let's. Uh, okay, here we go. Share, and then all I got to so, do is, is uh, go to the bottom, and here we and go. Share that. Yeah, there we go. See, twenty. All fixed. 20, okay, yeah. we're all good now. All fixed. Now they can't cop. Now I, they. I, I know. Years. I know. Holly was all worried about that. It's so like really seventy worried. years from today's date now to. to uh, to just to okay, get so so Holly, uh, Ron, drive safe. Thank uh, you very much. And thanks for being here, Holly. Here's here's my big question for you, uh, Sally Richardson, who is uh, I, I believe she's on the other side of the pond, uh, and is with IsraelProphecy.org, and is suggesting that uh, last year was an amazingly bad year, but couldn't 2021 be even worse for the NIR? Uh, yeah, I don't see any reason why it couldn't be. I mean, honestly, every year is, it <laughs> is a bad year for the prophets, but, um, the, the thing is every year, like I said, they always prophesy, um, the same, often the same things. This is the year the great transfer of wealth will begin. This is the year the great in time harvest of souls will start to be brought in. This is the year the stadium Christianity will will begin to be fulfilled. And actually, that was a big prophecy last year was um, many people were looking to these big NAR events to fill stadiums. Um, and and interestingly, those events were all um, canceled due to COVID. And so that was another thing that I didn't mention that, you know, about some of their failed prophecies for last year. But um but it's often just the same. If you watch these prophecies over and over every year, you see it's just a lot of the same prophecies that are being recycled year after year. The thing was that 2020 was such a different year 
that they were just doing their same old prophecies they do every year. And that year it didn't work <laughs> because, you know, COVID was such a big thing and, and the, the unrest in the nation and the election and, and everything. So, um, but um, I, I guess 2020 could, could be another equally bad year for them. We will see. Or 2021. We will, I, and I'm not sure how much you're following the uh, uh, CRT, critical race theory slash intersectionality, mm -hmm. and, and its impact on culture. Mm -hmm. uh, the massive amount of unrest kind of being informed by that view, uh, and the assault on the Christian faith more quite overtly. I mean, we just, for example, saw the prayer in the uh, mm -hmm. House of Representatives by uh, 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 a Methodist, liberal, I would suggest, calling on a Hindu god uh, mm -hmm. and, and ending in ah men and ah women. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty overt. Mm -hmm. how, how is NAR going to deal with that as Christianity seems to diminish over the course of the year instead of having these massive revivals? Yeah, it's... it's um always just new prophecies um they, they double down on their prophecies they'll often say things like well it looks this way in the natural realm but what's happening in the spiritual realm is what's happening different than happening in the natural realm that you have to have the eyes of faith to to see it uh you know the oh, faith the is really clinging on to right. these prophecies this is what i just heard them say actually um it was on the Victory Channel, Dutch Sheets, Bill Johnson, and um, Lance Wallnau were being interviewed on the Victory Channel on December 16th, I believe it was. And and that and Dutch Sheets said something to that effect that um, you know, faith is is believing the prophets, even when from all appearances it seems like what they're saying is in the natural realm is not happening. Um so so more of that that same type of thing, I think we can expect to see. This is maybe more of a personal question because I'm always fascinated with why do people believe what they believe, whatever it is. To you, in your research, have you come to any kind of understanding on what the attraction to this is for the average believer? Yeah, I think there's different things. I think some people that come into the NAR are desperate to see healing, either physical or emotional healing in their own lives. And so the apostles and the prophets, um, what they do is they make people dependent on them for virtually everything. People become dependent on them to receive healing. They become dependent on them to, they want to experience greater intimacy with God and the apostles and prophets promise or, or that they can reveal um, secrets that will help people develop greater intimacy with God, um, to know God's will for their lives. The apostles and prophets claim that they can reveal God's will for people's lives. Uh, they, they have the keys that people can learn, use to learn to work miracles, to receive uh, financial prosperity. Um, so virtually, uh, virtually everything, they claim that their revelations hold the keys to those things. And so, but I would say a big draw for many people is, is a desire to experience greater intimacy with God. Or, or I think it also appeals to pride. I've been told by many people who used to be part of the NAR that um, it appealed to their pride. There were people that felt like they were going nowhere in their life and, um, you know, their career wasn't where they wanted it to be. Um, maybe uh, they're a homemaker at home raising children and they feel like they're not really out in the world impacting the world in the way they would like to. And so um, it appeals to their pride that that they they could actually be um, if by engaging in something like strategic global spiritual warf warfare and doing spiritual mapping and these type of things, they could actually be waging great spiritual warfare that's having this effect in the world. Um, and and so so I think that's a draw for people in the movement is a sense of meaning and purpose and appealing to the ego. Well, that's a good point. A sense of meaning and purpose giving me. So what you have then is uh, hmm, maybe familiarity breeds contempt. We all know that line. Familiarity breeds contempt. It can happen in all kinds of relationships. I'm married over 50 years now. 
Uh, and today, in fact, for the last probably three decades, when I do premarital counseling, I caution the potential spouses on a few things. One is when you get what they call a seven-year itch, when you reach a point in your marriage where you're becoming a little dissatisfied with one another, it's probably not a time to try to fix your marriage. It's time to hold on for all you are worth because it is just a feeling and it will pass. The more you tinker with it, the harder it will be probably to stay married. Never let the word divorce cross your lips. Never. Uh, and then you start fixing your marital life as you redevelop your relationship one-on-one. -on -one. Now, how does that work itself out spiritually? It means getting back into the word, getting some commentaries, getting different views on the passages and falling more in love with God. But that's how it comes through his word. Do you, would you disagree with that? Uh, that, that how, um, how we fall in love with God is through his word. Is yeah. that specifically? Um, no, I, I would not disagree with that. I would agree with that. I think, um, I think, time in God's word is um, meditating on God's word, not in the NAR sense of the, the term meditate, but to really, to love scripture, to be reading it, to be studying it, to be memorizing it, to, to constantly be thinking deeply about it. Um, and in a Psalm 119 sense of the word meditate, you know, meditating on scripture and Psalm 119 is actually my favorite Psalm. Um, because uh, I, I think God's word, just really studying it and dwelling in it and knowing it well is is um, really the probably just about the most important key to um, having a vibrant walk with God and an intimate relationship with him. Right. Uh, yeah, it absolutely is. And we, we kind of miss that because we tend we tend to think of relationships as tasks we have to perform, especially men, because we do tasks. That's what we, we fix things. We do tasks. We're not really relational. And and, and I kind of jokingly tell, when I, again, premarital counseling guys that the woman you're about to marry has relationships. She doesn't do tasks. Now, that doesn't mean she doesn't do tasks. It means that's not her primary emphasis. She has relationships. She has relationships with everything. She has relationships with you, relationships with her house, relationships with her work, relationships with her whatever it is. We do stuff. We fix stuff. We do tasks. So they'll call me, for example, and go, okay, I want to hang this picture in the living room, and my wife doesn't want me to do that. And I go, okay, well, then don't do it. They go, what do you mean? I go, she has a relationship with your living room. You just live there, live with it, right? It's a matter of getting to know how someone thinks and operates. Listening to what they tell you, they you might have a list of 10 things to do to be a successful husband, but doing those 10 things doesn't make you a successful husband because you have to have the relationship with the woman you're married to. That comes only by knowing her and she mm -hmm. tells you what it is that makes her happy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so knowing God, right. So to know God, we need to know his word. Right. Right. But that does take work. Actually, that does take work to meditate on his word does take work mm -hmm. uh, to spend time, not just reading it, although that is important, but actually studying it in context. And that's where commentaries can come into play. Good commentaries, I would suggest. And good books, like, mm -hmm. uh, what was your first book uh, uh, that you read? The big thick one. Um, are you talking the uh, the one I wrote? Co -wrote? Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, a new apostolic reformation: a biblical response to a worldwide movement. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, and um, there's a Bible reading plan I just discovered, Don. You may have known of it. I, apparently, it's been out a long time. Do Dr. Horton's. Professor Horton's Bible reading plan. Have you ever come across that? I have not. Um, it's a it's a neat Bible reading plan. You can find it. There's a website and they have apps for it. But basically what you do is every day you read 10 chapters of the Bible. And it's like one chapter from Matthew, one chapter from Genesis, one chapter all over the all over different places in the Bible, one from Psalms, one from Proverbs. You do 10 a day from 10 different books of the Bible. 
And if you do this every day for a year, you end up reading the entire Bible through once and multiple books of the Bible many times, multiple times through. Um, and it's really neat because a neat thing about this plan is you can see the connections in scripture right. that you might miss when you read Genesis 1 at the same time as you're reading Matthew 1 at the same time as you're reading Psalms 1 and Isaiah 1. You know, you, you see neat connections and it always can fall differently as you read through it. The chapters can kind of line up differently. Right. So you might see fun connections and things that you've missed before. And, and it kind of surprises you. I, I, I like to go through the Bible chronologically. And I do it. In fact, I use uh, audio Bible every morning. Uh, and it gives me an opportunity to kind of think about what is being said. Mm -hmm. And then you start picking up other connections. You go, wait a minute. I heard that in. Uh, so you can go back and look and say, okay, well, that's where that came from. Mm -hmm. It's pretty interesting. So, mm -hmm. Kali, I, I really want to thank you for being with us again and for hanging around afterwards. Uh, this is really important. I, you know I'm very concerned about the Enneagram, but there's several major heresies sweeping through the church today, virtually unchecked. New Apostolic mm -hmm. Reformation is one of them. Mm -hmm. The Enneagram is one of them. Mm -hmm. Critical race theory is, mm -hmm. is just causing chaos in a number of mm -hmm. churches as the Southern Baptist movement is trying to figure out what to mm -hmm. do with that. Uh, so it isn't as though it's just one thing, but there's one thing that will fix it, and that is staying close with God. So, mm -hmm. Holly, thank you. Thank you, everybody else. And uh, we're going to say goodbye for today. Thanks so much. Thanks, Don.